Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Pitch. I'm Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us for this special event. The Pitch is one of my favorite shows to do because what we do is we bring three knowledgeable, capable uh, strategists together, uh, experts in their, uh, in their discipline, to share some of the charts that are top of mind in their own process. We actually uh, you know, ask, ask each of them to bring five charts along with them. They get seven minutes to pitch you their best ideas right now based on their toolkits and what they're seeing around them. And then once they each have a chance to share their uh, words of wisdom and their, the charts that are uh, bringing these ideas uh, to the top of mind, we get to discuss them as a group, look for themes, look for patterns, and uh, have a broader discussion about the overall market environment. It's been so much fun doing this show and, uh, and excited to welcome on our three guest uh, commentators, guest experts today. First, we have Dave Landry, founder of DaveLandry.com, joining us from uh, the New Orleans, uh, Louisiana area, or Louisiana more broadly. Um, we have Grayson Rose, Vice President of Operations at StockCharts.com, joining us from the Seattle area. And Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, joining us from South Carolina. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Appreciate it. Great to be here. Good to be here. Thank you, David. So this is quite an environment. Uh, you know, we're we're at the point where the S and P is threatening all time highs. It's teasing that key thirty four hundred level has not quite eclipsed it yet. Uh, so much discussion recently about leadership rotation, about themes, about you know what should be the the bets you make uh, as the S and P is testing all time highs. Do you bet on offense, betting on things going further to the upside? Do you get a little more cautious here and think about uh, protecting for the downside? Let's get right to uh, each of you. Let's talk about your uh, your picks, and then we'll we'll discuss them as a group. I want to start with uh, with you, Dave Landry. Uh, okay. You sent some charts ahead of time, so thanks for uh, thanks for giving me those. And uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll give you a shot to uh, pitch your five ideas, and then I'll uh, discuss them with you very briefly. Start with NVAX. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. NVAX. I like this chart because it's in a nice longer term uptrend, and if you look at the bottom. We have ACP indicator, and this is what I call Landry Light. And this plugin is actually free. So you just have to go to the right side of your screen, hit the little plugin and install it if you want it. And what it shows you is the number of days the lows are greater than the moving average. And one thing lately, if you plot this on a lot of charts, you probably think it's the greatest indicator in the world, <laughs> but everything works better with trend. And it's just, that we're in a nice trending market right now. And that's why this indicator has worked so well. And by the way, I see an indicator as more of an illustrator. As you'll see in my other charts today, there most of them are blank charts. And I always start with a blank chart before I add any indicator to it whatsoever. And the reason I call them an illustrator is it helps to illustrate what's actually happening in the chart. Now, in this particular case, notice that you've had the lows greater than moving average for a long, long time. In other words, you've had that Landry light. And then we've pulled back to the moving average. You notice that the, the count of the Landry light has gone down to zero. And that's usually a good place to look to get in a market, especially something that's in a nice long extended trend like this. And so for me to trade this stock, it would have to get above 150. If you look at the little bar right around that moving average, the wide range bar down, that's what I call a TKO. And if you want more in that pattern, we did a show, second or third show, I think in my trading simplified shows. So you can go in and take a look at that. So a little knockout type of move helps to maybe attract some eager shorts, maybe knock out some nervous longs. And then sometimes that can clear the way for the market that had higher. So if it did trigger, let's say around 150, a stop would be below the low of that bar, way down at 112. It seems a little extreme, but that's what it calls for. And then you would look to probably take profits, whatever those, uh, let's see, 150 minus 112, probably about 30 points above, maybe take partial profits up there. And then, of course, trail the stop higher. So it's in biotech. Now, biotech has lost a little steam as of late. But in general, there are some selected issues that are still doing really well. And there's a lot of individual strength within biotech. So that's NVAX. That's my first choice for today. Perfect. Chart number two, Sorrento Therapeutics, also in biotech. 
Yeah, and these charts, by the way, are in no particular order other than maybe alphabetical or however they got sent in <laughs> to uh, Dave. Now, here's another case where you have a nice uptrend. And notice that the uptrend from mid-July on began to accelerate higher. And then we've had this nice little pullback in here. And I would say an entry above today's high. I like the little fake out that it did earlier today. This stock looks like it's destined to go on to make new highs and beyond. This is uh, healthcare and biotechnology stock also. So on all of these stocks, you wanna make sure, of course, you wait for an entry. In other words, you wanna wait for them to begin moving back in the attendant direction. You actually wanna buy higher as opposed to trying to get a bargain. But in this particular chart, you can see, so it has a little bit of that knockout look to it, just kind of a generic pullback too. And again, I like the way it accelerated through early August until this recent little correction that we've seen now. So again, wait for entries on something like this, wait for it to begin to rally before getting too excited about it. Okay, next chart, Dave. Okay, this is an IPO. And if you know me, I'm a trend guy. And some people call me a trend following moron. And that's fine. Just don't call me late for dinner. You can call me what you want. But in this particular case, even though it's headed lower, I would be looking to buy when it heads back up. So notice that we have the first day of trading, it traded higher, and then it began to come back in. Now, for an IPO, I won't trade it on the day that it comes public, I'll actually wait till at least the close of day five. So if an IPO comes public on Monday, the earliest I'll get in would be the close of day five. And I'm looking for a new closing high in this particular case. So it would be an entry up around 25 or so on this one. And that would be on a close above that. So an intraday trigger, like if you go back to the, you don't have to go back to the charts, but just going back in your mind's eye to like SRNE or the NVAX, it would actually have to rally up and you would get an intraday. On this particular pattern, I call it buy at B because if a market's gonna go from A to C, it's gonna have to pass through B along the way if B is somewhere in between. So it's gonna have to pass through 25 if it's going to 50. So with IPOs, I trade more of a breakout pattern. So obviously you don't wanna buy it unless it starts going up, it's the old, what is it Will Rogers or Will Rogers saying? Um, I get them mixed up. Which one is it? Let's. Uh, is it Roy Rogers? Who said um, buy stocks that go up? If they don't go up, don't buy them. One of them had a horse, though. So I think I've got them confused. <laughs> I think it's Roy Rogers, right? Um, anyway, I got those confused. <laughs> it made so much sense in prep. So that's uh, RKT. We can go to the next chart now. Okay, here we have silver. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of trading efficient markets, but every now and then an efficient market can make an inefficient move. And notice that we've had Landry Light for a long, long time, and we've begun to pull back in the top chart. Notice a little knockout move a couple of days ago. So I would look to get long above that high and a stop would go right in below the low. That's almost a textbook type of TKO. It does have a little bit of a gap in it, but I'm not too worried about a gap in something like a commodity related stock. So I think silver, I'm bullish on silver right now. Gold's gonna be a very similar pattern. And I would also keep an eye out on the silver and gold stocks, but this would be a good way to get a little exposure while looking to get long those particular stocks. And next chart. So next up, once again, we have an IPO and so far it's headed lower. And notice that we have, let's see about six days or seven days worth of trading. So now we would start looking to buy this stock on the close, but notice that the day one set the high so far. So the other pattern was buy at B. And one of the rules of that pattern that we showed earlier is that it has to be a new closing high. But in this particular case, it would have to be a new closing high above the day one high because the high so far was set on day one. And that's not quite as complicated as it sounds. I'm actually doing a webinar tonight on IPOs. If you want to attend, you can go to DaveLeonard.com and I'll flesh these out a lot further. But in this particular case, it would be a buy up around 740 and that's on the close. It's not a trigger intraday. So if you see a close up above that day one high, I would look to get long this particular stock. And then if you want to stop, I would put in a stop a couple of points below, maybe down around 15 or so, just in case it's we're wrong and getting in too early, we get stopped out and we have to lick our wounds and move on. So this, those are my five for today. Still a bull on biotech, even though it's lost some steam. 
very bullish on IPOs. A lot of IPOs been taken off lately. I think that could be the next opportunities in the IPOs. And then also, I like silver and the precious metals right now. They're doing very, very well. So look to get long silver, look to get long possibly GLD. And then, of course, look within the sector for individual stocks there. That's such a great take, Dave. And I love the, you know, you mentioned a number of things in there, but especially, you know, three of your three of your charts, if you think about uh, the, the biotech names and also silver, these are all things that have pulled back a little bit. The groups, I mean, biotech is a, is a bet. If you look at the IBB, certainly has, has pulled back. I think a lot of people have questioned whether that's the beginning of much further downside or an opportunity to buy on dips. I think you've made a good case for uh, for doing that. And then silver and gold obviously got hit pretty hard this week so far, but uh, but recovering so far uh, today. You you had mentioned the uh, the Landry line. I, I, I don't want to get too deep into questions because I want to come back to it. That's part of your uh, ACP plugin that you uh, that you have in there. It's beautiful how you're illustrating um, the distance from the moving average and, and thinking of that consistency as a great input. Awesome. Actually just, Thanks so much. A, qu a quick uh, correction on that. It's actually the number of days it's above the moving average. So it's not magnitude. It's just days. And, the and amount of we... time. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. right. Absolutely. Yeah. right. Grayson Rose, welcome to the show, my friend. David Keller, good to be here. <laughs> so you sent some charts uh, ahead of time as well. I, I'm, I'm sure uh, people uh, following stock charts are familiar with you and uh, and your work as vice president of operations Maybe. here at stock charts, but also a published author. And you, you've done some fantastic work, uh, you know, teaching, I think, empowering individual investors to make better decisions through tensile trading, through stock market mastery, uh, which is a, a website that you've uh, that you've designed. Um, so I'm very interested to hear your take in terms of what investors should be doing right now as the S&P is sort of threatening those uh, those new highs. So take it away with uh, with Alphabet. Threatening new highs indeed. And I mean, if we actually look at, uh, you know, if I'm going to own the S&P 500, I'm going to buy something like SPY, which is actually trading at new highs. So, you know, when we look at the index, it's not quite there, but some of the uh, the tradable ETFs where we're actually going to, you know, park some cash, they are at new highs. It's It's a crazy, crazy time. But um, yeah, you know, I was just thinking before I, I kind of dive into it, I was just thinking, I, I love this show because it's so fun to see so many different types of, of picks and so many different styles and things. I mean, I'm, I love watching Dave's work with the, uh, you know, IPOs and things like that and, and shorter term stuff. Most of my charts here are, uh, they're all one year charts. So, you know, we got a little bit longer term view and, and I know Tom does a lot of kind of three month type of window stuff. So just got to say, I love this show because we get so many different perspectives. It's a ton of fun. Um, anyways, kind of kind of diving in. So, you know, you and I, Dave, have we've talked about this quite a lot. A big part of how I approach the market um, from sort of a discovery perspective is thematic investing, thematic trading. I love to think thematically about what's happening in the market. So, what I've observed in in my years in the markets for the last you know decade, um, what I've observed is that many of my best trades, many of my best investments, have all come by sort of being observational and stepping away from the charts, looking at the world around me, thinking about the themes that are playing out just in the world in general, because stocks at the end of the day, they're companies, they have products, services, they're businesses, they're things that you can actually go use, try, touch, buy, any of that stuff. So I love to think thematically about where I think, you know, the markets are going to find some strength, but then confirm that on the charts. Um, I'm not going to dive into anything because I think that it should be working. I'm going to dive into something because the charts tell me that it's working and because the relative strength shows that it's leading the market higher. Um, you know, there's nice money flow into it, all that kind of stuff, trend, all that. Um, so what I actually do in, in my own analysis is I keep these lists. I call them theme trade lists. Um, and they're, they're just different themes, you know, remote work, cybersecurity, streaming, all these themes that we think about. I love to keep lists of all of those. And then at the end of the week, I'm constantly scanning those to find What's actually making new highs? What's trending higher? What's moving higher? What's leading the market? All of that kind of stuff. So most of the things that you'll you'll see me talking about today are all sort of from some of those themes that I like to watch. Um, so first up, we've got Google. Google, I think, is really, really interesting because it actually ticks two of the themes that, that I like to watch. One of them is this cloud adoption theme. We've seen a lot of people talking about the strength in, uh, in cloud stocks uh, for, the, for the last couple of months, really the last couple of years. Um, but Google actually, I think, is a really interesting streaming play in addition to, to cloud. They've obviously got Google Cloud, and they're in so many different things. But from a, from a theme trade perspective, Google also has YouTube. They actually own YouTube. And I can, I'm hearing more and more people talking about cord cutting and moving over to YouTube TV 
and sort of embracing that as their uh, as their TV content option. So I think Google actually with that YouTube business is a really, really interesting streaming play that's going to continue to play out. Technically, what I'm seeing is some nice leadership. I'd like to see it leading a little bit more. If we look at that top panel of the chart, that's Google versus VTI, which is the Vanguard Total Index, the total stock market. Um, it is outperforming over the last year, not as strong as I'd like to see, but still some, some outperformance there, which is great. Um, what, I'm, what I'm mostly looking at is where it is just sort of a, a pure price play, making new 52-week highs, trying to, trying to test this, uh, this move to new 52-week highs and, and sort of solidify this breakout. Um, but you know, also sitting nicely above its, its 20, its 50, and its 200-day moving average, um, you know, again, moving up to new highs. Um, and what I'm also seeing as you scroll down that chart a little bit, you've got accumulation distribution and on balance volume sort of in one panel. That's showing me that there's great money flow into this stock. So as I see a stock that's kind of moving up to new highs, trying to break out to, uh, to new highs, and I see nice money flow rotating into it, that's great. Um, I'm expecting this to, to continue higher. I'm expecting the relative strength to pick up a little bit more. Uh, and I, I really like the move in Google technically, and then also from a sort of a theme trade perspective as well. Uh, so that's, a, that's the first one I've got. The next one, kind of a similar pattern. It's a little bit further into the breakout. Uh, Zillow. So Zillow, I think, is a really interesting sort of real estate tech play. I'm actually in the middle of trying to buy a house right now. And it's, it's fascinating. I don't know how anyone bought a house before Zillow and Redfin. I mean, I, I'm spending all of my time, my fiance spending all of her time. We're just spending our, our entire day on Zillow and Redfin. We do nothing else other than I look at charts and then I go look at houses on Zillow. That's it. So, you know, I think Zillow as a sort of a real estate tech play, kind of the future of real estate, um, their business is, is pretty dynamic. And then technically what we're seeing now in the middle of a, of a pandemic, which is crazy, um, we're seeing a, a huge pickup in this move to the suburbs and things like that, people kind of getting out of the city. And so Zillow and Redfin actually both have been doing really, really well technically. Um, Zillow, what we're seeing right now, again, beautiful relative strength. I love that move in the top panel, really, really firmly outperforming VTI. That's just a great move and kind of starting to accelerate too. That's uh, that's beautiful to me. Um, I also love, again, sort of a, you know, from a pure price perspective, where we are breaking out to new highs. It had a, a big jump a couple of sessions ago, but again, sort of trading nicely above its moving averages. Uh, I think this is the start of a, a big run for Zillow. Uh, nice volume on the move. I mean, that was a huge, huge volume move the other day. Big, big spike there. Uh, I do think that the accumulation distribution is not as attractive as I'd like to see. That's kind of the one weak point on this chart. But on the scooter score, I mean, we've got a scooter score of 94.5. That's the stock charts technical rank. I think that's a, a great position to be in on Zillow. So I really like Zillow uh, thematically and technically. Uh, Tenable is another one that's, uh, that's kind of similar if we keep going down here. Uh, a cybersecurity. Jump in. We only have a minute left, so I'd love to get through your next three charts here quickly. Sure. If we yeah, we'll we'll run through them really quick. Cybersecurity here is is kind of the play on Tenable. Again, beautiful relative strength. It's kind of already made that breakout to new 52 week highs and came back to test it, and it's it's bouncing higher off that now. Again, good volume and great accumulation distribution. I, I really like to see that from from Tenable. Uh, down in Viva, we have again sort of a, a health tech play actually here. Viva is basically cloud for the uh, the healthcare industry. Great relative strength, nice outperformance. And for you trend followers, this has already made the breakout. It's continuing to make that move higher. I really love the way that Viva is trading. Uh, nice accumulation. Again, nice money flow into the stock. Great trend here from, uh, from Viva. And then Spotify is a, is a streaming play. Now, this is actually one that, uh, that I do own. Uh, my entry point on this was the breakout to, to new 52-week highs back in May. Uh, but what you're seeing here is some consolidation after the, the big, big move higher in Spotify. So I'm, I'm looking at this as a potential entry point sort of to, to add to it. Um, but I think this is a, if you're not in Spotify, this is potentially a, a great entry point for a long-term move in, uh, in Spotify. Great relative strength, great out performance. Love the volume on the initial move and the, the accumulation distribution continuing. RSI kind of resetting back to, uh, to around the 50 level. Great scooter score. Lots of good things, I think, from Spotify, especially at this sort of, uh, you know, small consolidation level that, that we're seeing there in the stock right now. So. It's, you know, it strikes me, Grayson, as you're going through your charts, and thanks so much for that. It, it hits me, especially on, on something like Spotify, that um, I think it's very easy in an environment where the market's threatening new highs to think that most stocks kind of look the same. It's just a homogenous mm -hmm. market out there. But you're looking at something like Spotify, it's, the characteristics of it are actually very different than the average stock. It's sort of a, it's a very sure. different look. And 
And I see what you mean. It's, you know, long-term uptrend, short-term downtrend is sort of that sweet spot buying on the weekness of uh, potentially right. riding it. To Going back to the 50. I like this. Uh, I like this position on Spotify. Very, very good. So just to review your five picks, we'll go here to the summary. So uh, you're basically putting us in technology with Tenable Holdings and <laughs> Viva, uh, putting us in communication services with Alphabet and Spotify, and then throw in a, uh, a little real estate, although not a traditional REIT, more of a, yeah. a Zillow, but kind of a tech a real estate there, but... services, but but certainly one of the better ranked stocks in the uh, in the real estate sector. Five good picks. Yeah. Tom Boley, thank you for joining us, my friend. You're very welcome. Great to be here. So uh, Tom is the chief market strategist at EarningsBeats.com. Uh, he's a he's a well known uh, face and voice to many of you. A longtime host of uh, Market Watchers Live, and uh, and and also now doing trading places with Tom Boley. And uh, you can find his work obviously at his website EarningsBeats.com. When I think of Tom, I you know to be honest, there is a small group of people. I think of Arthur Hill. I think of Tom Boley probably Grayson Rose as stock charts experts that when I started working with stock charts, I, to be totally honest with you, I watched what you did a lot just to learn how to navigate the system and get better at it. So I, I consider you a, uh, a, a power user of, uh, of the, of the top, of the top uh, percentile, if we would make that sort of ranking. Um, you've given yeah, us uh, five picks and uh, we'll start with a, uh, a name people might not be familiar with Tesla. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's heard of this company or not, but uh, I think it's flying below the radar right now. Um, before I get into that, though, I do want to say, you know, we need to get Grayson another hobby. I mean, really, Zillow and and stock and, and charts. Stock that's it. <laughs> and this I is a man off. who's engaged in everything. I, I'm I, I might tell uh, the future Mrs. Rose what, what a time to be on mute. Thanks for that, Tom. <laughs> well, let's get to your picks, Tom. Take it away. All right. Yeah. Test. I got a fourth. I need a fourth later today, by the way, Grayson. Um, Tesla. Um, first of all, you know, my background as a trader, I really uh, favor momentum trades. So I actually bought all 10 of the stocks that Dave and Grayson went over as they were going through their charts. I, I thought they were all great picks, um, but uh, they look kind of similar, I'd say, to what I you know, what I'm going to be looking at, what I'm going to be showing you. Tesla has just been a tremendous grower. And when you look at their uh, latest quarterly numbers, which I put there on the chart, I mean, this is what I look for. I look for companies being, you know, a, a former practicing CPA. I like to have companies that, that where you can trust management. And when they give you promises, I want to see them over delivering, under promising and over delivering. I think that's been a hallmark of Apple over the years. And so I keep a strong earnings chart list at Earnings Beats. And so all these companies that I talk about today will be coming off of that uh, strong earnings chart list. And again, I just want to see companies that are, you know, providing, you know, working with Wall Street, giving them, you know, their take. Wall Street analysts walk away, they come up with their estimates, and then these companies are just able to just blow them away. And so if you take a look at Tesla, their revenues came in 6.04 billion versus 5.23, their earnings per share. $2.18. The market was looking for a loss of 49 cents. I mean, I'm not talking about beating estimates by a little slim margin. I mean, Tesla is just blowing it out of the ballpark. And so I highlighted on here just recently, we've had a few trips down between that 1300 and 1400 level. I think that's a pretty good area of support that I would be watching on Tesla to the downside. I'm not sure if we go back down there, to be quite honest. I think that news with the five for one stock splits got a lot of folks excited. And so I'm looking for, you know, pretty big things on Tesla. The other thing that I would point out too here, Dave, if you scroll down to the bottom of the chart, that, that very last panel at the bottom shows the industry group that Tesla is in relative to the S&P 500. And my philosophy, and when we put our portfolios together at Earnings Beats, the thing we really look for are leading stocks in leading industry groups. And if you think about the whole, you know, what are you doing this for? My objective is to beat the S&P 500. So I want to be able to see all of my charts, um, both on an individual stock basis and then also industry group related on a relative basis to the S&P 500. And when you look at this, I think it's pretty clear that not only do you see Tesla going higher, but it's also going higher relative to its peers and relative to the S&P 500. And its peers are going higher relative to, it, to the mm -hmm. S&P 500. So this, in, in a nutshell, is really what I try to look for. It doesn't mean I would go out and buy any auto company. I certainly would not be looking at GM and Ford. I think Tesla is the place to be in this space. So let's move on to the next chart, 
which is uh, United Parcel. And on United Parcel, again, if you take a look at those revenues and earnings, um, and, and by the way, many of these companies, you know, Grayson mentioned the AD line, accumulation distribution. This was a huge clue for me back in April and, and even back into March. And you'll see right there, yeah, I mean, AD line moving higher. And if you look at the circle below all those candlesticks, notice that they're almost all hollow. Very, very little selling during the day. And one of the things that alerted me to the fact that I believe that this was a continuing part of a secular bull market, even in the depths of March. I remember writing in Chart Watchers back in mid-March saying, I believe this was a cyclical bear market in a secular bull. And a lot of folks thought I was nuts. But one of the reasons why, if you go back and you study 2008 and the financial crisis, there was a lot of selling after the opening bell. In this particular instance, if you go back and if you just stayed out of the market, and I'm talking about overnight, and bought 9.30 in the morning, sold at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and did this all the way from February 19th to March 23rd low, you actually would have broken even. There wasn't much selling taking place. So I think the AD line has been a tremendous indicator in showing us where money has been uh, or which stocks have been accumulated during this crisis. And you can see UPS certainly during March, even though it was moving to new lows, that, a, that uh, AD line was starting to move higher. But let's keep going because this one uh, certainly looks good. And I think FedEx, by the way, is another one uh, that could possibly uh, be very strong. I was kind of having trouble picking between the two. I think they're both so strong. The third one I have is advanced micro devices. Again, a stock that's broken out recently, consolidated for a while on a nice base. You can see that going across at about $59, multiple tops in that area, and then finally breaking out with massive volume. And again, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of that chart, you'll see semiconductors very strong relative to the S&P 500. So you've got AMD, which is breaking out relative to the semiconductors and now consolidating a little bit. Um, and, but also part of a group that's been outperforming the S&P 500. So again, leading stock in a leading industry group. Then we'll move on to the fourth stock, which is Quidel. This is in medical supplies. Now of the four that, or five that I picked, I would say medical supplies is maybe the least attractive relative to the S&P 500. And you can kind of see that again down at the bottom of this chart. But I would kind of, you know, kind of like Grayson was looking at Google, I think, you know, overall the uptrend medical supplies versus the S&P 500 is still there. And even though we've seen the underperformance in medical supplies for the last month, and I think Dave touched on this with biotechs, healthcare has been sideways consolidating a little bit more. I don't think it's bearish. I think they're basing. And if you look at the first panel below the volume, where I just show the medical supplies index, you'll see that consolidation that I'm talking about, where we're just simply going sideways here and have been for the last month. But the group is trying to make a breakout today, and Quidel is one of the leaders. I think that this 50-day test coming down was an opportunity here on this stock. Then my final chart that I have is Take-Two Interactive. Um, this is another one that is just in a great group. Once again, if you go down to the bottom, you'll see it's part of the internet space. It's been very strong, continues to trend higher versus internet, versus the S&P 500, great volume trends. And on all of these charts, uh, if you take a look at revenues and EPS, they're all beating top and bottom line. I do think that take two reports here in the next week or two. Uh, I don't know the exact date, so their earnings will be coming up soon. But I also circled again back in March, all those hollow candles. I promise you, if you look at airlines and cruise lines, hotels, you're not going to see those kinds of candles. You saw a lot of distribution. In the case of these charts that I'm showing you, many of these were being accumulated back then, and we're seeing why now. Those are five uh, fantastic charts and, and a great uh, a great set of pitches there, Tom. Just to review uh, your ideas. So again, we're in, we're in technology in the form of a semiconductor named AMD. You have us in Tesla, obviously in consumer discretionary, part of the automobiles uh, industry group. Then we have UPS within industrials. We have a healthcare name within medical supplies, QDEL, and then communication services with Take-Two. So five different uh, sectors that you've got uh, indicated there. So it's a great pitch, guys. And as I'm looking at um, just keeping the back of the envelope uh, stats as you guys are talking, uh, as a group, the the three of you, we, we had four names within technology. We had three within communication services, three within healthcare, which is, you know, so my first observation is we are all, as far as I can tell, sort of in the bullish camp uh, that there's not a huge rotation away from some of the leadership names. And it's more about sticking with some of these charts that maybe are at, at uh, actionable buy points. 
um, which is uh, which is one first takeaway. Um, the second thing I'd love to chat about is just with uh, what was not represented. So the se sectors that were uh, that were not there, uh, consumer staples, uh, where you have a, obviously a handful of names making new highs. Energy, which I don't blame any of you for not including that. That's that's decent. I, I think that shows you are looking at charts probably for sure. And then utilities, which is interesting with uh, with yields remaining at all time lows. We missed an opportunity to to pick up some yield in, uh, in utilities. I'd love to start with that first point, which is just thinking about uh, the leadership groups. I think a lot of people are nervous about, uh, you know, some of these some of these groups that have been so good, um, you know, sort of rotating away and all of a sudden we, you know, a value trade reemerges, um, but it, it certainly feels like we're more in the uh, on the growth side of the equation. Is anyone seeing anything to disagree with that? Or does that seem pretty, Tom, you and I were talking about actually growth versus value before we started. What's your take on that relationship here? Yeah, I mean, I deliberately looked at five different industry groups because that's really our philosophy at Earnings Beats. I try to get leaders in different industries rather than try to get overly concentrated in one area. I mean, every one of those groups I brought up, I really like, um, and I like many others. Software could have been an easy group to pick, and that group's pulled back quite a bit. I think there's still some great names there. But this market, I think, with interest rates where they are, the 10-year Treasury yield sitting at you know down below 0.7%, I know there are a lot of folks that are looking at the market and they think it's just too frothy, that the PE ratios are too high. And I can only say based on my background, being in public accounting for 20 years and actually valuing companies when I was in public accounting, when you've got interest rates sitting near historic lows and you've got earnings growth, the way some of these companies are, are posting their growth. I mean, you look at Apple and Amazon, Tesla, many of these software companies those earnings are extremely valuable. I mean, your alternative right now to buying Apple, which is posting tremendous growth and a dividend yield, by the way, which is higher than the 10-year treasury yield, your, your, op, your alternative is to buy a 10-year treasury, which <laughs> is just makes no sense to me. And I believe that interest rates are going to stay low if you listen to the Fed. I believe that, that rates are going to remain low for, for quite a while. And I think that, that you know the chart that you've pulled up there, I think really – uh, speaks volumes. When that when the rate took its last tumble back at the end of 2018, that 10 year treasury yield, when it went down, check out the growth versus value. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the money's rotating to. So, I mean, you can sit back and say, well, value hasn't been, you know, traded and it hasn't been in favor. So therefore I want to go in value. But you could have been saying that the last four or five years. And it wouldn't have gotten you very far. I think you got to stay with what's working. I think rates stay low. I think any of these companies, and, I, and personally, I think the economy is going to be very, very strong going forward. It was very strong in February when we got into the pandemic. I think we're going to be very strong and strengthening coming out of it. And so I think these companies that can grow earnings rapidly, I think they deserve very, very high PEs. And I think that's what we're seeing. It's a, it's a, this is a great chart. And so this is the growth versus value ratio up here, the IF, IWF versus IWD. And then you can see the 10-year yield here we're looking at. So you can see the the downtrend in yields, the the outperformance, and, and again, I mean, I've heard all along this whole last couple of years, three to four years, I've I can't tell you how many times I've heard about the return of value, and it still to date has not actually materialized beyond just a little blip on that chart. So I think I think sticking with that trend, I, I think that's a that's a decent take for sure. Um, Grayson, uh, you know, you made some uh, points talking about your process, and, I, and I, when I think of you, I think of someone who's screening through ideas very well, sifting through, and so you're always surfacing tickers that makes me want to, you know, uh, dig into a little, little deeper. So yeah. when you think about the sectors that weren't represented in, you know, in your picks, but if you look at the three of you all together, you know, sectors like consumer staples, energy, uh, utilities, um, and, you know, again, energy, there aren't a lot of great trends in that sector, to be honest yeah. with you, but in consumer staples, I could find some charts making new highs and the same with utilities, you see some decent yields. So when you're not coming up with, uh, you know, particular ideas in those spaces, is that part of, for you, is that part of a top-down decision that I think the S&P is going higher, which means I want to be in growth, which means I'm going to focus on these sectors, or do ideas kind of naturally bubble up through some sort of screening process, and then you're naturally just not getting ideas in some of those sectors? How, how does that work for you? That's a good question. You know, I think it's kind of a combination of the two. Um, you know, everything for me starts with this top down approach. So I'm, I'm always digging through starting with the market and then digging through the sectors, digging through the industry groups. And inevitably, when you do that, you end up zeroing in on the sectors and the industries that are working and ignoring the ones that aren't. So, you know, one of the things that I do every week is um, as, as part of that is just kind of look at the uh, the, the major S&P sectors. Um, and I look at them specifically with the scooter ranking and I, and I sort them 
uh, all 11 by, uh, by the scooter score. And then what I do actually, I have it in, a, in a, my own chart list. I've also got SPY in there. And the interesting thing about adding SPY in there is that you can basically see the S&P 500 and then all of the sectors in one list uh, ranked with the same system. And so you can sort of see what's above and what's below. Yeah, just like you got there. You know, what's above the S&P 500 and what's below the S&P 500. So, um, you know, when I look at this every week, the things that I'm targeting are the, the sectors that are staying above the S&P 500. And I'm kind of ignoring the stuff like energy and financials that are just perpetually stuck at the bottom of this list. I, you know, I just don't really want to dig through that stuff. Um, you know, what we've seen recently is obviously tech, but a lot of, uh, a lot of strength coming out of discretionary and services. Um, some staples, staples has kind of been fighting for a spot on there. Actually, materials has been really interesting, but I, I haven't really been finding individual names in there. I'm still mm. intrigued by the sector more broadly as a whole. I think there's a lot of strength there. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of a combination. You know, I, I probably gravitate more towards those. And then that's kind of where I'm where I'm searching. But also I'm doing that intentionally because I, I want to own the stuff that's leading. I want to own the stuff that's outperforming the S&P 500. That's my goal is to outperform the S&P 500. Just like Tom is always saying, you want to own stuff that's outperforming the S&P 500 if you want to beat the S&P 500. So, you know, that's kind of where I naturally go. Wise words there. Grayson, I knew I liked you because as you're talking, I have this queued up. This is something I look at as well, which is looking at sorting the sectors in the S&P by the scooter rankings. This is what you're yeah. getting at that, you know, the top three are, are not a huge surprise. It's tech, consumer discretionary, communication services. You know, Zill, I, I'll give you a pass on Zillow being down here because it really isn't. I mean, it's in there with a it's, bunch of pretty boring, high yielding REITs. So it's a little different. Yeah. Um, but 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 your take is pretty good. And I and I should acknowledge, uh, you know, I, I cheated a little Dave Landry and, and considered your silver bet as part of materials, although technically not true. It's an ETF. But I, I, I just counted that as a basic materials bet for the uh, back of the envelope calculation. So I get what you're saying. And I think you're right, Chris. I think, you know, through the natural screening process, you're probably going to gravitate toward those types of mm -hmm. spots because those are the better those are the better charts. Those are the ones that, that rank better. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm always running scans for like new 52 week highs and the things yeah. that are going to come across that scan are going to be in the leading sectors. They're not going to be in energy. So that's kind of where I end up gravitating. Now, Dave Landry, I'd love to go back to your chart of, of silver. You know, obviously yeah. we're recording this on uh, on a Thursday afternoon, August 13th. This is after, you know, Monday and Tuesday were, were or, or um, Tuesday, Wednesday, sort of a bloodbath for the precious metals. These are, yeah. you know, gold and silver had gone vertical, right? And then in two days, all of a sudden, it feels like the world's ending and, and it's the end of the, of the metals trade. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's bouncing back. And you're highlighting this as a long idea. I'd love for you to just speak to how do you, as a, as a trader, as an investor, deal with something that goes vertical like this? Because you know something like this is going to happen, right? It's right, going to happen right. at some point. So how do you how do you approach that? How do you deal with well, knowing that's well? Coming? Yeah, I actually, it, it's, it's funny you should ask, because I actually was thinking about doing a show for stock charts next week or for my week in charts, which I do every Thursday on my own website about the downside of trend following. Everybody tells you mm -hmm. all these great things about all these great systems and stuff, but there is a downside to it. And momentum ends really, really, really badly. <laughs> now in a case like silver and, and believe me, I was hurt. I got knocked out of two metal stocks yesterday, dropped a few or day before, dropped a few F-bombs, you know, <laughs> cause I'm, I'm human too. I still have a pulse. I had, but what happens, like in this case, as I said earlier, that that wide range bar down, that's a, that's a knockout move. In fact, I got knocked out. So one way of, of asking yourself, is that knockout move big enough? If you were long that sector as a trend follower and you got knocked out, then it was big enough to knock some people out. And it's also big enough to attract some eager shorts. So right now, as we're speaking, this is triggering, okay? And so anybody who shorted it and did not cover yet, is now going to be forced to cover. And here's the thing, shorts have a bigger ego as a general statement than those who just go long. And believe me, I, I short the market too. As you, If you go back and watch some of the trading simplified shows, I show a lot of shorts, especially when the market is rolling over. But the shorts in general tend to have big egos and they tend to confuse the issue with facts and they tend to put valuations on thing and things. And as Grayson talked about and, and Tom talked about, a lot of these stocks seem like the valuations are crazy, but hey, they're going up. And, and so that's how and why I, I would be willing to go after these markets that look a little parabolic and look a little scary, but I'm going to wait for an entry and I'm going to take some partial profits along the way, just in case I'm wrong, as I have in the golds before I got knocked out. 
and then I'm going to trail that stop higher. So mm -hmm. for lack of just for illustrative purposes, that 30 day EMA could be a good little trailing stop. As long as your Landry light down below is green, stay long the chart. Uh, you know, uh, one thing real quick, you mentioned yeah. screening uh, when talking to Grace and my way of getting a feel for things, just because uh, maybe people would like to know, is I look at about 2000 stocks every day and then I see where the setups are stacking up and I'm still seeing setups in biotech, even though it's rolling over. I'm not seeing anything in energy right now that I like and I'm seeing setups in metals and health services in those type of sectors. And by the way, Tom, the QDEL, I had that on my list that I published to my private clients. And I, I didn't include it because I didn't want to include too many off the list and, and aggravate my clients. But I like that pick and I like the way it pulled back to the 30-day to the moving average. And that's another stock that looks a little scary right now. But I think if it triggers, it could go on to make new highs because you've got that, as Dave Keller was just asking me, that knockout type of move happening. So you've got a big old knockout there. A lot of people probably got scared out of it. You know, one, one more thing while we got you, Tom. The I'm, I'm always making jokes about the candle people, and I use uh, open high low close <laughs> charts for the most part. But I might have just learned something from you with the hollow candle, so mm. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous now. I might actually have to start going over to those funny looking charts, you know. You may be one of the candle people <laughs> not far off here, Dave. Well, the reason I'm not a huge candle fan is it's always a pattern. It's like, oh, it's three birds crapping on a wire or it's a fat sumo wrestler sitting on a little baby. You know, it's like, it's not always a pattern. Sometimes the market is just choppy. So <laughs> that's why I, I give the candle people a hard time. But uh, well, And it's funny. I think, Tom, the way you described it is, is how people should think about it. It's less about this is what the pattern is called. And it was more, look at what this means. There are these big hollow candles, which means there's accumulation. I think that lining up with the accumulation distribution was, it's, it's actually a beautiful way to illustrate that, that buying the interest coming out of the lows, right? Yeah. The, the AD line, I think was probably the most important indicator of 2020. Uh, I don't think there's any question about it. It was so important that I actually developed two different chart lists. One, well, each chart list with about 300 different stocks on it. I went with a strong AD chart list and a weak AD chart list. And so you can imagine the weak AD chart list was just littered with airlines and cruise lines. And sure. I mean, you know, if you pull up something like um, you could pull up like AAL, Dave, yep. um, on the same chart. And so when you see the stock going down back in March, you see the difference between that using mm -hmm. the AD line and look at where it is now. Yeah. Look at where the AD line is. I mean, there's still no, there's just no, seems to be no interest. And so I have no interest in a stock like that. I don't use the AD line as my primary indicator, but I certainly like to use it as a secondary indicator. And I also would agree with Dave. I, I think the biotechs are really setting up here. And if you look at a longer term weekly chart, you'll see that they've been consolidating, but they're getting really, really close to the rising 20 week EMA, which I think is a great entry point into the biotech. So I wouldn't be surprised to see some of the money. And the, the thing is, you know, trading is such a psychological game. And, you know, when you see Apple and Tesla and all these other companies going up and you're holding Regeneron Pharmaceuticals or Vertex Pharmaceuticals and they're going nowhere, you get impatient. You get a lot of folks bailing out of biotech to go chase something else. And then about that time, that's when you see the reversal back into the biotech. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a big move coming on the biotechs. So um, I, I agree with you. One thing one thing I like is that I like to do is is, again, look at a whole lot of stocks and by going through a couple thousand stocks every night and going through my momentum list of about 300 to 400 stocks every night that comes out of that 2000, I scan for every night, I see a lot of pockets of strength. And in a case like, now this is this could be like a really good thing. Let's say the energies have bottomed out for six months and all of a sudden you're starting to see buy signal after buy signal, even though the sector still looks kind of crappy. But right now I'm seeing quite a few interesting biotechs, even though the sector is looking a little bit on the questionable side. And the other thing that I'm seeing, and I don't know how I could quantify this, but there's like individual excitement in biotech. I'm watching all these little intraday scans and alerts and biggest movers and everything. And you'll have stocks rally 100% overnight. There's, there's, there's all this excitement about, I guess, a COVID vaccine or all these other things that are happening and people that anything COVID related, you know, I'd I made a joke. I'm going to invest in these shell companies are going crazy too. So speculation is alive and well. I'm going to try to find a, a shell company that invests in electric cars that go around killing coronavirus. You know, but <laughs> but uh, you know the biotech. There's just the, the hot spots, the amazing hot spots that I'm seeing right there. 
right in biotech is just really cool. So there's there's kind of like a mini bull market going on, even though overall it looks a little bit uh, on the questionable side. So that's uh, interesting observations, Tom, and uh, good stuff. I, I agree with you on that. I'd love to just finish with this thing because we're guys, we're almost out of time. I wish this could go on for a couple hours because this is, this is a lot of fun to pick your brains on these kind of things. You know, just finishing with this discussion of biotech and, and maybe Tom with semiconductors kind of come to mind. These are groups that have been thought of as leadership groups. They have been doing very well, but all of a sudden kind of pulling back. You know, when you think about, uh, you know, I know I, you know, talking before and I won't, I won't ask you, you can, if you want, talk about your multi, your end of the decade prediction on the S&P, but Short answer is it's higher than where it is now from what I could what I could read. But I'm curious with something like with the biotechs or the semiconductors, at what point would you say, Uncle, this is this isn't working? Growth is no longer happening, things are starting to rotate lower. Is there a particular breakdown or a set of breakdowns or a level or a pattern that you would see on some of those charts? Maybe AMD, which because it was one of your uh, one of your picks. You know, what would you look at there that would tell you, okay, this is it. I need to recalibrate and, and pick something else. Well, tell, tell us how you think of that here. Well, I mean, for me, you know, I know Wall Street's smarter than I am. And so <laughs> I don't try to outsmart. I don't try to say, you know, try to impose my will on the market. I just follow what the market's telling me to try to keep it as simple as possible. You know, I thought uh, Dave's, uh, you know, his uh, Landry light is just something that's really simple. That if you're a momentum trader, you can just kind of follow. I mean, I think you stick with things that are working. And I think and Grayson mentioned this as well. You just stick with things that are working until they're not working anymore. You know, as you run your scans, as, as the conditions of the market change, your scan results will change. Your relative strength will change. Um, I'm just not going to say, well, we've run too much. We can't possibly go any higher. If I had done that with software three years ago, we would have missed one of the biggest runs in software ever. So I, I just think you have to let the market talk to you. Tom, you know, my nickname is trend falling moron and uh, you're kind of hinting at that a little bit. So I already have the name. I have the domain too. So you're not, you're Perfect. not going to take, you're not going to take that away <laughs> from me. Coming, coming soon, a new website focusing <laughs> on, uh, on Dave's potential weaknesses. Um, you know, it's funny. So I, I, my, my, my background at a large buy side institution, we had a huge 13 foot screen on the wall and we would always joke never confuse the bottom of the screen with support, never confuse the top of the screen with resistance. And I think you guys have highlighted some charts that have gone up and to the right, but there are a lot of reasons why that trend can continue for a lot longer than uh, today. Guys, that's it. That's that's our time together. This was a blast. Thank you all for bringing five great ideas for you. Especially thank uh, Dave Landry from davelandry.com, Grayson Rose uh, here at stockcharts.com, and Tom Boley from EarningsBeats.com. You can check out the pitch, all of our previous episodes, and lots more to come on our YouTube channel, or just follow us on Stock Charts TV. Thanks, everyone. This is Dave Keller from StockCharts.com. Have a good night. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching the pitch. We had so much fun talking with uh, Dave Landry, Tom Boley, and Grayson Rose today. As a reminder, all the charts we talked about, we're putting them in a chart list. There's a link on your screen, so you can access those charts directly through your own Stock Charts account. Follow them going forward. Have a great day. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.